the stage and Judith is going to acknowledge the land that we are on, its history and its people. Ladies and gentlemen, Judith Sayer. Elizabeth asked me if I would come up and acknowledge, recognize, and thank the Esquimalt and Songhees people of the Greater Coast Salish people. It's a great event on beautiful land. The territory of the Songhees and Esquimalt has been occupied by them since time immemorial, and the beautiful water, the beautiful land, is what we are trying to preserve as a people. And I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about that tonight. And really appreciate that um, Elizabeth is giving me this opportunity. And once again, thank you to the First Nations who have lived on this land and cared for this land so that we may enjoy it today. Kweko, Kweko. spin. There is no spin doctor in the house. <laughs> Carl Rove was not invited here. <laughs> there is no robocalls that are going to be heard in the house on any cell phone. Instead, what we are trying to do is stimulate your intellect and stimulate your imagination. And we are doing it by introducing people who are magnificent spirits. Individuals who have contributed to our society both intellectually and emotionally. And we're going to first start with some music. Now, there's music that gives you goosebumps, and there's music that gives you goosebumps on your goosebumps, <laughs> and there's music that sends you into the stratosphere. And then there's Dan Mangus. <laughs> Dan Mangus! There are leaves in 
the trees, there are trees in the forest. band in Glasgow, uh, Scotland, and then moving on to my hometown, Edinburgh, Scotland, after that. And uh, I, I asked him, if this, if this gig doesn't work out for me, can I actually join his band as a concertina player? And uh, he said yes, uh, but then he told me he said uh, yes only because he doesn't believe that this gig isn't going to work out. <laughs> Sitting down on uh, the front row over here, I see our next uh, speaker, uh, who I first met in uh, at Tim Hortons. Uh, Ken Wu is a pillar of our community. Ken Wu is uh, one of the great Victorians. I think many of us know him as a, uh, an astonishing man. And I just want to say that in this campaign, <laughs> Ken Wu has been a rock for me. He has identified for me what counts. He has discussed with me strategies, but most importantly, he's discussed with me principles. And he's identified the basic principles of our society and our politics. And I have learned so much from Ken Wu. He
he is a great person. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Wu. Cat out the back that I go to Tim Hortons to eat donuts. <laughs> that caused trouble for me in my supporters. <laughs> um, so I'm very uh, grateful to uh, be invited here uh, tonight by Donald and Andrew. Almost didn't make it down. I got these uh, mysterious automated robocalls <laughs> saying the venue had changed at the last minute. <laughs> so, <laughs> as you know, Canada has been afflicted by a terrible case of Harperoids for several years. <laughs> Harperoids first began in uh, 2006 uh, as a case of minor harperoids, uh, flaring up into major harperoids by 2011. Uh, for, the, for those of you unfamiliar, harperoids are a very painful, debilitating condition characterized by several symptoms. Uh, characterized by the gradual loss of democratic functions, characterized by the diminishing mobility of the uh, working class, by the accumulation of toxins in the vascular system of the air, rivers, and oceans, and by the general inflammation of liberals, progressives, and environmentalists. <laughs> but there is hope. The best treatment for harperoids is a good dose of democracy. <laughs> Recently in the United States, uh, millions of voters use democracy as preventative, uh, as a preventative treatment against the onset of romnesia, which is a very similar painful condition as harperoids. But uh, specifically here in British Columbia or here in Canada, uh, what we need to treat our harperoids are some greens. Uh, <laughs> if you can help Canada get some greens a relatively small dose, like two MPs right now, it will go a long ways towards uh, boosting Canada's uh, democratic immune system and bringing a treatment forward for uh, dealing with harperoids. Together, we can put an end to this pain in the ass. <laughs> reasons for me is that Donald is about the, uh, one of the very few politicians right now making the case for electoral cooperation between the opposition parties as the virtually guaranteed path to oust the Harper Conservatives. Um, right now, uh, none of the major uh, opposition parties, uh, except for the Greens, uh, have been pushing for electoral cooperation. And they think that they can single-handedly win government. But if you actually look at the facts, uh, you see a different scenario developing. What you see is that uh, there will be a re resurging Liberal Party uh, under a Trudeau leadership, Trudeau uh, Jr., um, and uh, the, the uh, Mulcair NDP are still quite strong, but they, part of their votes will be taken at, through a surging Liberal Party. And in Quebec, the Parti Québécois has just been elected. They are the sister uh, provincial counterpart to the Bloc Québécois. Uh, so the conditions are being laid right now essentially for uh, a very smug Harper government who knows that a 20-year Harper dynasty is in the making right now. And so how is it that electoral cooperation will change this? Well, the details of electoral cooperation have got to be negotiated out between the parties, but it could look like essentially the NDP, the Liberals, and the Greens agree not to compete in the key conservative held swing ridings where the conservative incumbents literally won by a few thousand or a few hundred or even by a few dozen votes. Uh, so if there is only one agreed upon candidate in those ridings, you will virtually guarantee the ouster of those conservatives in those swing ridings. Or it could be a simpler version which is uh, essentially pooling campaign resources together uh, to back the agreed upon candidate in those conservative held swing ridings. But the net effect of electoral cooperation would essentially mean uh, the most important, first and foremost, is that Harper would lose his majority and lose government. <laughs> but for the benefit of all of the opposition parties uh, in, in the agreement, it would mean more MPs, more seats for the Liberals, uh, the, uh, not the Conservatives, for the Liberals, the NDP, and for the Greens. 
and it would vastly increase the likelihood of an NDP or a liberal uh, government, a majority government. Um, and you would feel the upwelling, a massive collective sigh of relief uh, coming through the force as millions of living creatures uh, <laughs> a sigh of relief at, at the uh, demise of the Harper government. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> I tried to do a Star Wars analogy there. <laughs> okay, another reason to elect um, Donald is because uh, the Greens really are the only political party that truly understands the significance of the central urgency of the climate change crisis, um, as well as the uh, task for a monumental shift, the largest scale mobilization uh, politically, culturally, economically towards uh, a green economy, away from fossil fuels towards uh, clean energy and energy efficiency. Um, climate change is the most serious problem facing the planet. It can't be on the back burner all the time, uh, except when public opinion rises. It needs to be at the forefront, and so far the Greens are the only political party that is making it a central issue so that uh, the party is pushing it proactively, uh, pushing solutions proactively, and showing leadership. Um, and another key reason for Donald uh, and is because the Greens are really the only party that is also proactively uh, promoting uh, proportional representation and electoral reform as a central feature of their agenda. Um, so it's not. <laughs> so it's not enough to theoretically support proportional representation, but uh, it, it's vital to move that forward. Uh, the Harper government landed 39.6 percent of the popular vote last election, yet they ended up getting, getting uh, 54 percent of the seats in Parliament, and despite the fact that over 60% of Canadians didn't want the Harper government. So most of our problems, all of our problems, essentially are related to the non-proportional electoral system, and we've got to get the Greens uh, in there to keep trumpeting the need for that. So those are some of the reasons to elect Donald. Electing Donald would be a second Green Revolution in this country. You've seen how... <laughs> how incredibly effective one Green MP, Elizabeth May, has been as an opposition force unto herself in uh, fighting the omnibus bill, in fighting climate change, in fighting the Enbridge pipeline, in raising the Canada-China investment treaty. Think about what two MPs could do, what a team of Green MPs could do. In terms of political breakthroughs, the most significant number after one is two. For the first time, the Greens won't just be a flash in the pan, uh, one MP novelty, but a second Green MP will unleash a momentum for the rise of Greens across Canada. For the first time in Canadian politics, uh, we'll start to resemble the more sustainable and progressive democracies around the world who have whole sections of their parliaments represented by Greens. And for the first time, Elizabeth May will finally have some reinforcements in Ottawa. The definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expecting different results every time. Well, if we really want to change Canada for the better, we need to do something really different this time. And let's make history by establishing the first team of Green MPs in Canada by electing Donald Galloway and Victoria to Parliament. Charlene Wildman of the Echo Denny are entangled in an urgent battle to protect their land and their people from multi-billion dollar oil and gas industry and the current government interests that protect it. As a fo former oil and gas officer and lands manager for several northern First Nations, the daily inundation of paperwork proposing incursions onto his traditional territory and way of life led Caleb to pursue a legal education, becoming one of the first UVic grads granted the concentration in environmental law and sustainability. And I'd just like to say as a law student, he really rocked. 
<laughs> Caleb is also the subject of the upcoming documentary for, uh, film, Fractured Land. As the granddaughter of respected elders, Chief Charlene Wildman's mandate for the community is to ensure cultural survival for the coming seven generations. Wildman served her community as an elected council member for several years before recently being elected chief councillor. She's active on the land, hunting and fishing, and in her culture, continuing to expand her knowledge of Dene culture. She is the youngest chief in the nation's history. Ladies and gentlemen, Caleb Ben and Chief Charlene Wildman. Um, 
Lana Lowe, who are two very, very important people in our community that went away from home and they uh, went and got educated and they came back to help our people. So they deserve a round of applause. Yeah. So when I was uh, younger, my grandmother passed away when I was a child and my grandfather passed away when I was a teen. Those were two very, very important days and a big loss for our family. Um, elders mean the world to me. I love elders. I love anybody that's older than me is an elder. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some little ones that are very wise and they're my elders too. But uh, what I would like to say is that um, the reason why we're here today is because community members from Fort Nelson First Nation and I have some support in our local community and the elders were very concerned about what's happening. Um, we tried to work with government and we tried to work with industry but uh, we felt like our concerns were consistently getting ignored. So we decided to take a stand, and that was not, it, that was yes to protecting our water. Um, before that, we will sit down with government or industry. There's uh, conditions that they need to meet, and that is regional baseline studies. That is a must. Um, gas companies and provincial government must submit multi pre development plans. Cumulative effects and environmental assessments need to be addressed by, by submitting these development plans. Um, protection of our water and resources and, and cultural sites that are very important to us. We have many villages. Um, the community identified the Nelson River, which is under attack right now by industry, as a cultural site. Independent body on monitoring water, and I'm sure we can all agree on that. So most importantly, I think that everyone needs to understand that this isn't just a First Nation concern, this is a BC resident concern. And it's important that we all take a stand to protect our waters. We're all gonna be affected. <laughs> when we meet with our community, and we're at community meetings, and we're at ceremonies, and uh, the elders have opportunity sitting around Moose Camp, sitting around a drum dance, they're always telling us Ask them about the water. Don't forget to ask them about the water. The water is the lifeblood of our community. Our community has traveled these rivers and lakes and streams for Tom and Mariel. They're very important. They connect all our villages. Um, if you, it would be awesome. Why don't you guys come to our community? <laughs> and, and Caleb is right. Um, if you ever are passing through, if you're going to the Yukon or the Northwest Territories, stop into the office and just come say hi. You're more than welcome. No one will turn you away. I guarantee it. <laughs> so one very, very important thing that I want to let you know in a way that you can go home tonight and support us because I believe if you guys do this for us and then tell 10 of your friends, we might get another 10,000 votes. And that's by signing on, on our petition. It's called Protect Northern Waters. I see you writing it down, so. That's Protect Northern Waters. <laughs> so uh, that, that is a very important petition. Um, two community members came up to us at a community meeting and it was a really, really great idea. And if you sign that petition, we will be calling on you for your help to present that to Premier Christy Clark. So what is very alarming is the trillions of liters of water that will be withdrawn from our traditional territory. Currently there is 20 permanent light water licenses that are on Christy Clark's desk waiting to be approved. And that is going to devastate our community. We're really concerned about our traditional way of life. As you all know, my mandate is to ensure that uh, our community has um, water, can breathe fresh air, eat fresh food, and everything that you guys want. So we all want that, right? So what I want to say to all our allies, supporters, neighbors, friends, and relatives, if you share our values and our principles, please sign the petition. Protect Northern Waters. And at the count of three, if you're going home to sign that petition, I want to hear you say protect Northern Water. So, one, two, three, protect Northern Water!
Charlene. Um, I always love events when they occur on days like today, because when you go outside, we're having an extreme precipitation event. <laughs> We've had over 40 millimeters of rain fall at Braidwood Elementary, which is well into the 99th percentile of rain events, so it's quite exciting to have, for me, uh, to have something like this. It's actually more than that. The destruction of Hurricane Sandy a few weeks ago uh, back has actually brought the issue of climate change to the forefront of public policy again, particularly in the US. So much so that in his first press conference that he was elected, President Obama said as follows, I'm a firm believer that climate change is real, that it is impacted by human behavior and carbon emissions. I think we've got an obligation to future generations to do something about it, but we haven't done as much as we need to. But we heard none of these words, of course, leading up to the election, but shortly after Sandy, we start to hear them emanate from the President Obama. Just last week, actually, in the, the Yale Project on Climate Change and Communication also released a public opinion poll. And this public opinion poll was taken in September before Hurricane Sandy hit New York. What it found was that 92% of Americans believe that the President and Congress should make developing clean sources of energy a priority. That's not a small number. 92% of Americans believe that this should be a priority for the President. And of course, in British Columbia, we obviously have very similar belief systems. So what has this got to do with the next speaker? Well, it's my very great pleasure to, next, to introduce the next speaker, who's a local leader in the development of innovative clean energy solutions. Adam Creek is the co-owner of Recycle, a Vancouver Island-based organization that collects and processes waste vegetable oil and produces sustainable biodiesel for local consumption. Many of you may not have known that. Many of you may know Adam Creek as a two-time Olympian, an Olympic gold medal winner in the men's eight rowing in the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games. He's just about to set off in December across the Atlantic in a, in a rowing adventure. And ladies and gentlemen, please have welcome Adam Creek. To the stage. champion that wins something, and there's a champion that stands up for something. And I think all of us in this room tonight are champions because we're standing up for something. We're standing up for something that we care about, we care dearly about. And uh, I think what most of us deeply care about is the environment. And what most of us deeply care about in this room is, uh, is the natural world and making sure that we have something uh, for the future. And that's what I commend you for, Donald, um, wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you very much for having the courage to be a champion, to set aside a lot of time in your life to, uh, to run for this Green Party. And I think, Elizabeth, it's lonely. It's lonely being one. <laughs> and uh, one is lonely, but two's a team. And. Uh, And there is power in team, because uh, we're not strong all the time. And it's great to have someone at your side to lift you up and to, and to carry you across. And I'm a firm believer that we protect what we know and love. And myself, I got to know and love the natural world uh, through the lens of a rowboat. I started when I was 13. I got to know the water even earlier with my father when he would take me on canoe trips up in the north of Ontario. Uh, this, uh, this winter, uh, myself with uh, one Canadian and uh, two other Americans were rowing from Africa to Miami, Florida, across the Mid-Atlantic Ocean. And it will take us uh, two to three months to do that. And uh, one of the primary reasons for doing this uh, is, um, is not just adventure and seeking adventure, but also to study the earth and the planet and the water. Uh, that exists. Uh, one of the key things that we will be studying is ocean acidification. We have a lot of uh, scientific instrumentation upon this rowing boat. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us in this room, we all have different skills, we all have different talents and different passions, but in the end we all tie in to that same piece, that same uh, passion. 
And I think if we use our individual skills and we use our individual scouts, me just being a rower uh, deciding to row across an ocean, <coughs> but you being whatever you may be, a teacher or a, uh, or a parent or, a, or whoever you may be out there, but we can all use our individual skills and talents to make a really big difference. And uh, that's what we're doing tonight, and I think that's what you're doing, Donald. So thank you very much for all you're doing. And uh, remember, one is lonely, and two is a team. Please support <laughs> Donald. <laughs> um, before we move on, I would like to acknowledge two other Provincial Greens, who I just noticed were in the audience. Of course, the leader of the Provincial uh, uh, Green Party, Jane Sturk, is here in the front row, and beside her is Susan Lowe, the uh, candidate for his final. Uh, and clearing over here on stage right, we have Susan Lowe Fan Club as well. <laughs> the next person who will speak as we lead up to David Suzuki is someone who really needs no introduction, but someone that I'm gonna drag you through a long-winded introduction because I think many may not know the background of this person. Elizabeth May is an environmentalist, a writer, an activist, and a lawyer who's been active in the environmental movement since 1970. She's a graduate of the Dalhousie Law School and was admitted to the bar in both Nova Scotia and Ontario. She's held the position of Associate General Counsel for the Public Interest Advocacy Center, representing consumer, poverty, and environmental groups from 1985 to 1986. She's worked extensively with Indigenous peoples internationally, particularly in the Amazon, as well as with the Canadian First Nations, and was the first volunteer executive director of Cultural Survivor Canada from 1989 to 1992. From 91 to 92, she worked for the Algonquin of Barrier Lake. In 86, Elizabeth May became senior policy advisor to the then federal environment minister, Tom McMillan. She was instrumental in the creation of several national parks, including South Moresby, which I remember hearing about much when I was uh, in my university days. And this is, in, of course, in Haida Gwaii. Many may not realize that Elizabeth was also instrumental in the negotiation of the Montreal Protocol to protect the ozone layer, a key example of international legislation that led to uh, success and dealing with the global environmental issue through the coming together of the world's nations. She's taught courses at Queen's University School of Policy Studies, as well as teaching for a year at Dalhousie University to develop a program um, for a year, and that, that led to the development of a program established in her name in women's health and environment. She holds three honorary doctorates. We've got to work on that and get her a fourth one for you, Ben, in the next coming up here. <laughs> and she's, she's the author of seven books. She's served on numerous boards of environmental groups, advising bodies to universities, governments in Canada, including the Earth Charter Commission, co-chaired by Morris Strong and Mikhail Gorbachev. And she's a recipient of so many awards, I don't know where to begin, but some of the key ones, of course, are the Outstanding Achievement Award from the Sierra Club, the International Conservation Award from Friends of Nature, the UN Global 500 Award in 1990, and was named one of the world's leading women environmentalists by the UN in 2006. Her environmental work has been profiled in numerous documentaries, including the final episode of the acclaimed CBC series, Canada, People's History. In June 2006, she stepped down as Executive Director of Sierra Club of Canada, which she held since 1989 to run for the leadership of the Green Party of Canada, which clearly she was successful of, of and she became Canada uh, Green Party's ninth leader at their August 2006 convention. She's an officer of the Order of Canada, and in 2010, was Newsweek named her one of the world's most influential women. In 2011, much to the, the sheer joy of many of you in, in the audience, including me, who happens to live in her riding, she made history as being the first elected Green Party candidate in North America to the House of Commons. She now represents us in the riding of Sanish of Gulf Islands. And finally, she is without any doubt the single most effective politician from any party in Ottawa today. <laughs>
believe it, I never could believe it that I'd end up having a Nobel laureate running around putting up lawn signs. Um, <laughs> you know, not everybody gets that. We had, we did have tremendous success. When Andrew was going through that introduction, oh my, it reminded me of so many funny stories, which is unfortunate for those of you in the audience who know what happens when I remember funny stories that I have to tell you about. But I remember that last episode of Canada of People's History. It was very cool. I mean, that I was in, you know, it's, it's, you know, a documentary thing. And my daughter was in grade three, and they showed it to her at school. She'd been watching all the episodes. And we sat down in front of the TV one night for the last episode of Canada of People's History, and it featured me. And when it was over, my daughter, Victoria Cage, was named after my friend Vicki Husband. My daughter turned to me and said, congratulations, mommy. You're the first. And I was like, well, I'm the first what? She said, well, you're the first person who can ever see himself on Canada People's History because everybody else is dead. <laughs> I think it's made, and what it's like to be a member of Parliament. Uh, no matter what Adam said, and it was so cool to have all you wonderful people here, and, and Chief Charlene Wildman, and Caleb, and I, I'm so honored to have, and Dan Mangan to do an uncharacteristic political gig. Yeah. Uh, but actually, my life isn't lonely. I set out as I meant to go, and on my, you know, I was elected, as you'll probably remember, May 2nd, 2011, and by June 2nd, I was in Ottawa, the house was starting, and I decided, okay, um, there were an uncharacteristically large number of new MPs entering the house. 110 out of 308 were newly elected. And I thought, okay, I want to make sure that I can work across party lines. I want to make sure we break down the, the, the really pernicious and divisive and perverse, uh, really sort of, a, I, I do describe it as a cancerous growth on the body politic of intense partisanship that could never imagine that you'd actually want to work with someone in another party. So to start out, what I did was I hosted, I sent invitations, well, the invitations is another funny story, but I'll try to make it short. I got invitations, which wasn't easy, to the 110 newly elected MPs, and the invitation just said, come to a non-party party, come and break the ice. And we gave people name tags that just had first names. So we wouldn't necessarily know when we were meeting people, oh, you're a newly elected conservative, you're a newly elected new Democrat, you're a newly elected liberal. We actually could start getting, like, how's it going for you? What's your office like? Have you found a place to live? Just normal stuff. And that has stood me in good stead. So I'm not lonely in terms of my social connections, my ability to make friends, to worry about, believe it or not, I really was worried about Bambona's dog when she started having seizures. Uh, anyone would be worried about her dog. I mean, these are people you can make friends with, believe it or not. But what I, what I do have is a distinct lack of resources. I'm one member of parliament, and what I have found over and over again, and what that means is not just one in terms of the capacity to sit in the house and make sure nothing happens when I leave the room for a moment, there's always the risk of unanimous consent on something flying through. <laughs> that literally, there's no warning for unanimous consent. One day in early June of last year, I discovered that the Liberals, the NDP, and the Conservatives had all decided, and the Bloc, that it would be fine to pass a bill on something called mega trials without a single day of hearings before the Justice Committee. And I said, well, that's not right. That's not happening. I'm not giving my consent. So there's no unanimous consent, so we're going to have hearings. That's a very powerful thing for one MP to be able to do. But guess what? That's parliamentary democracy. That's how it's supposed to work. So my great discovery, which is not really much of a discovery because I was pretty sure it was true, is that in Westminster parliamentary democracy, there is such a thing as a member of parliament having the ability to make change. There is fundamentally the right of every member of parliament to point out when rules are being broken. Guess what? It's against the rules to yell at people while they're talking. Rule. It's against the rules of the House of Commons to speak derogatorily about others. The rule. It's against the rules of the House of Commons to mislead people, especially if you're the government members. So there are a lot of rules that are routinely broken. And I stand up on points of order, and I can stand up on points of order, and I can participate in every debate. And so some of you will already know this. At the end of my first 12-month period as a member of parliament, 
I said, Times Colin has called my office and said, can you check, you know, because, you know, the common wisdom when I got elected, well, backing up, the common wisdom was I couldn't get elected, right? So that was, that was the first common piece of punditry across the country. Everybody knew it couldn't possibly be Gary Lund. That was clear, so they knew that. It was amazing how when I won, without skipping a beat, the common wisdom among the punditry and the political panels and everyone became, well, the Greens are happy they got one person elected, but of course we'll never hear from her again. <laughs> because everybody knows one MP can't do anything, right? So, at the end of the first year, with the question from the Times columnist, did how much, you know, did Elizabeth get to talk much in the House? How much compared to the average MP? And we went back and checked the record of Hansard, and we discovered that yes, actually, uh, I spoke in the House of Commons. In fact, when we checked, I'd spoken more in the House of Commons than any MP by a good margin, including Stephen Harper, Bob Ray, or Tom. <laughs> speaking, I found even with my tiny little office with a really dedicated staff, and they're all watching, it's being live streamed now, so thank you Craig Kenton, thank you Paul Noble, thank you Deborah Ettinger, thank you Kathleen O'Hara and Jesse Cody and all of the interns like Zoe and the pro, Jamie, we have an amazing team with one MP's budget. We prepared, we, well first of all, read and analyzed the omnibus budget bill before any of the other parties had looked at it, Bill C-38 last spring. We put forward 330 amendments to try to block that bill, to force changes. It's such a contempt for democracy that a bill of 425 pages changing 70 laws would ever have been tabled at all. But it's really an affront to democracy when that bill goes to first reading on April 26 and emerges in June with royal assent without a single amendment being accepted, without a single change to the destruction of the Environmental Assessment Act, the destruction of the Fisheries Act Habitat provisions, the destruction of, um, the na of changing the National Energy Board so it's merely advisory to cabinet, so cabinet can overturn it, 70 different, eliminating the National Roundtable, 70 different laws amended, gutted, and repealed, and not a single change. And then, again, with my small resources, we were the only ones who initially noticed that the Canada-China Investment Treaty had been tabled. Because it was tabled twice. <laughs> so I'm giving the, 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 the message here that I want to share is, yes, being one Green MP has allowed me to do so much more than any other individual MP is capable of doing. But you know, it's not because I'm special or any, you know, there are a lot of very bright, wonderful people in all the other parties. Really, there are. Their problem is that they have to work within the constraints of this partisanship, this hyper-partisanship that says that we're not electing MPs to make wise decisions or seek out good public policy based on sound evidence. We're electing a bunch of people who really care about their communities, who think they're public spirited, who want to become members of parliament to do good work in public policy, and find themselves once elected to be meaningless cogs in a political machine that's run by a bunch of backroom boys who are only thinking about the next election and care nothing about public policy in the moment. because more than anything else, I want to liberate them <laughs> from the structures and chains which bind them to reading out idiotic statements on cards that have been prepared for them. <laughs> they must be liberated! <laughs> to unchain democracy and prove that it works, I can't do it by myself. Because every time I say in Parliament, well, it is, you know, it's quite fun, but again, the joke is getting old on behalf of myself and my entire caucus. <laughs> no, I, you know, I'm a hundred, you're the only caucus in Parliament that's a hundred percent female. <laughs> Never 
have a party whip in the Green Party. I read the bills. I decide what's in the interest of the voters of Saanich Gulf Islands. I work for them. They are the people who put their trust in me, and I will not miss a vote. I will not miss a day in Parliament, except to go to the horrible climate negotiations next week in Doha. I work for the people of Saanich Gulf Islands, and I will fight pipelines, and I will stop super tankers on our coastlines, and end frank fracking, and protect First Nations rights, and by God, if there's any way in this world to make Stephen Harper resign, leave, or get fired before 2015, I'm gonna find it. the pundits and the assumed wisdom that everybody knows the Greens can't win. It was a fluke Elizabeth May won. It's a fluke. I guess she talks a lot, and I guess she did put up the biggest fight on C-38, but it's just all down to the category of me as some kind of anomaly in the political system. It's not. It's about me understanding the way democracy works, respecting Westminster parliamentary democracy, and knowing that if a super bright dedicated, genius guy like Donald Galloway gets to be in Parliament and do what I'm doing on his own, not taking my orders, but reading the bills and doing the work and preparing the amendments and speaking out on every single bill, then I know the only MP in the House of Commons who's got a chance to speak in the House of Commons more than I do will be Donald. <laughs> period before David Suzuki speaks. And in that brief stretch period, what we're going to do is ask for your help. There are volunteers all around the edges here. You know you got in here for free, but you know you're not getting out for free. <laughs> so we're going to pass buckets along the aisles. You can throw in cash. We're splitting it between Donald Galloway's campaign and the Provincial Greens campaign for Andrew Weaver. If you have a credit card instead of cash or a check instead of, and you want to designate, okay, Donald Galloway's campaign, okay, DC Greens, just put a hand up to make sure someone comes to you who has the information for credit cards. Otherwise, the, you know, just of those of you who go to church know what it's like, those of you who've never gone can imagine. They actually <laughs> pass baskets along and you put the money in. That's the way it works. And then you go to heaven, see? So, <laughs> We have 37,000 of these to hang on doors. We have them ready to go for student residences at UVic too, that tell people who haven't thought of it, this is how you vote, this is where you go, this is what you do. It's public service information. Each door hanger has a sticker on it that tells people at their very 